sisters, it's an amazing experience to be able to stand here at this very spot. I don't know if the right word is daunting or humbling, but it's something along those lines. Um, I'm here today by assignment. I've been sent by President Ballard, the acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, to preside at this conference. And I've had the privilege over the last three and a half years, as I've served as an Area 70, to travel throughout the state of Utah and preside at conferences all over the state. I don't think that there's another building quite as beautiful as this one to gather together for a state conference. I hope that you don't take this for granted. This is a remarkable place to be gathered, uh, brothers and sisters. I think of the long history of this building. It was dedicated, as you know better than I, um, 1915 by Joseph F. Smith. And I think of all the testimonies that have been born from this very spot. And that's why it's humbling to think that I have the chance to add my testimony to those testimonies that have been born from here. And my testimony is, is that I know that our Savior rose up from the grave and overcame death. And because of that, we all too have the opportunity to rise up over all those things that hold us back, that we can return to our Father's presence because of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, it's an honor to be with President Sheffield for this conference and his wonderful counselors. President Davis and President Lisenby. And I just want you to know how much your stake president loves you. I've, as we've prepared for this conference, he's done most of the work, but I have the great sense that he cares deeply about you. He thinks about you, he prays about you. Your successes are his successes and your challenges he feels very personally and you're lucky to have a man of God like him to lead this stake. No, he's not perfect, but that's okay because people that are perfect are really annoying to be around. <laughs> but I'm grateful for his service. I'm grateful for his commitment to be able to take on these weighty responsibilities. I too am excited for upcoming conference. The good news is, is that I can say with a high degree of confidence, there is a talk prepared for every single person personally in this congregation. A talk that you need to hear that was prepared specifically for you and that if you heed its counsels, it'll be a great blessing in your life. The bad news is, is I have no idea what conference that'll be presented in, so you just have to tune into all of them. I'm grateful for the contribution of this stake all around the world. And maybe I could just share with you a mission president's perspective. Um, as has been already said, my wife and I had the great privilege of presiding over the Washington DC South mission a couple of years ago. It was our privilege to serve with over 700 missionaries. We had missionaries from every single high school along the Wasatch Front. From Highland High School, where my wife and I graduated from, we had one missionary during the three years. From East High School, where our children, our eight children have all attended school, we had one missionary. But as I drove from your stake center to this building today, I drove by Lone Peak High School. Lone Peak High School had a profound effect on our mission. At any point in time, we probably had 10 missionaries from Lone Peak High School, more than any other high school in the valley. And brothers and sisters, I want you to know that the youth from this area are greatly needed out in the mission field. They are a great blessing, not only in my mission, but I guess that's the same in every mission throughout the world. Not only to be there, but to be leaders. You've trained them well. They were my district leaders. They were my zone leaders. They were my sister training leaders. They were my trainers. I relied heavily on them. 
So please understand the important contribution that youth from this stake make when it comes to missionary work all around the world. And to you parents who sent missionaries out, and to me this is personal, I have a son serving a mission right now. We talk a lot about the sacrifice that missionaries serve when they leave, but we rarely talk about the sacrifices that the families make in allowing their missionaries to go out and serve. I dropped my son off at the MTC about a year ago and I haven't fully recovered. I'm still pretty traumatized by the whole experience. But that's okay, because there's nothing else I'd rather him be doing at this time than serving as a full-time mission. But we sometimes act like that's a normal thing to do. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing normal about sending our children or our brothers and sisters or our grandparents to faraway places for them to be separated from us. All you that have missionaries serving out in the field right now, please know of my gratitude for your sacrifice. It's not an easy thing to do, and I recognize the remarkable um, commitment that you've made to allow yourself to be in that position. Can I just comment to anyone that might be suffering from mental health issues? I won't ask you to raise your hand. But I'm guessing if we're being completely honest, as most of us, if it's anxiety or depression, and I'm not a mental health expert, so I hardly know the words to even use to talk about this. But if you've experienced trauma or adverse childhood experiences or compulsive behaviors that you've struggled with, or if you suffer pain or fear, please don't ever give up. You're not alone. We love you, but more importantly, your Heavenly Father loves you. A lot of times we suffer in silence. We don't want other people to know that we're hurting. Perhaps we might be embarrassed or ashamed, thinking that we've done something wrong to bring this affliction upon ourselves, or that it's a moral failing or a character flaw. Perhaps we might think that if only we had more faith, it would all go away, or if our prayers were more fervent, Heavenly Father would answer them. Brothers and sisters, that's not what this is about. This is a health issue. And I pray that we may have the sensitivity to listen to one another, to help one another, get the help when they're struggling. This much I do know. The Heavenly Father loves all of his children, and he loves them perfectly. And if you're in a position where you can't feel his love for you, that does not mean he doesn't love you. To the contrary. Heavenly Father's love for each of us is perfect. He will always love us. And because he loves us, he has a plan for each and every one of us. All of our plans are different. No two are the same. And our plans are similar in the fact that they all include tribulation, trials, and affliction. That's the one thing that we all share in this mortal sojourn that we're on. And it's interesting because we may not always understand why we're given the trials that we have, but we could rest assured the Heavenly Father, His ways are always just. He knows exactly what He's doing, and because of His love for us is perfect, we can trust in Him without any question. He trusts us enough to let us struggle so that we might become more than we might otherwise be, that we could become who he wants us to become, that we could reach our full potential. As a young child, my father and my parents would take us down to Fillmore, Utah, where most of our relatives are from. I remember going to my grandmother Huntsman's gravesite. It's a little headstone, a very humble one. She died when I was one year old. I have no memories of her. She had a 
very hard life. He died of cancer at an early age. And on our headstone, it simply says, sweet are the uses of adversity. I believe that was coined originally by William Shakespeare. And as a child, I was so confused because I thought adversity was a bad thing. How could it possibly be sweet? But it said, sweet are the uses of adversity. And as I've grown and had more experience in life, I can now look back and understand exactly what that meant. Because it's only through trial and adversity can we truly learn the most important lessons of life, brothers and sisters. And so I'm grateful that our Savior has a plan for us. And because of his love for us, we can overcome all things, as I mentioned before. That anything that distresses us, anything that holds us back, anything that causes us fear or discomfort, the weight of sin, loneliness, physical pain can all be overcome through our Savior. And I'm grateful for that. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to share with you a few thoughts today about our prophet, Russell M. Nelson. He just recently turned 99 years old, which means he's in his 100th year. That in and of itself is amazing. But I remember when he became prophet, it was in January of 2018, I mistakenly thought because of his advanced age, he would have a hard time getting things done and he wouldn't be able to leave behind much of a legacy. Boy, was I wrong. And I think of all that he's done to teach us and to lead us and to help us place the Savior at the center of all that we do. One of the first changes that he made, and it was often overlooked by the outside world, they said that it didn't make a difference. He asked us to refer to the name of the church as the Church of Jesus Christ. And I think about that because that sets the tone and the pattern for about everything else he's asked us to do. That he wants to make sure that at every opportunity we place the Savior at the center of all that we do. That we follow his example. That we do the things that he would have us do. As I think about the other things he's taught us over his tenure as prophet, <clears throat> I can't help but to think maybe the most lasting impact is what he's taught us about the covenant path. It's hard to believe that prior to his time as prophet, as president, we did not talk about the covenant path in nearly the same way that we do today. In fact, it feels so natural to talk about the covenant path, it's hard to believe that it's not something that has been part of our vocabulary for very long. But the covenant path is something that President Nelson talks about in almost every address he gives. The ability to make and keep covenants. I want to just reflect upon that <clears throat> for a minute. President Eyring said, Latter-day Saints are a covenant people. From the day of baptism, through their spiritual milestones of life, we make promises with God and he makes promises with us. He always keeps his promises offered through his authorized servants, but it is the critical test of our lives to see if we will make and keep our covenants with him. Brothers and sisters, I don't know if you've ever been able to attend a baptism. You probably have, probably many times. Have you ever noticed the beauty radiating from a face as they come out of the water? I don't think that that's just a figure of speech. I think it's a literal thing. As they come out of the water, it's our belief that they're washed clean and pure from all their mistakes from the past, that the mistakes are washed away. And in that moment, as they come out of the water, brothers and sisters, they are perfect. They are clean and pure and qualified to be in the presence of God. Isn't that what we all want at the end of the day through the covenants of baptism? 
But unfortunately, we have thoughts, we have negative thoughts. We make decisions, we make wrong decisions. We take action, we take the wrong action sometimes and we don't re remain clean and pure forever. But a loving Heavenly Father knows all things and I'm grateful for the opportunity that we have to have the sacrament each week because the sacrament is literally the opportunity every single week to make ourselves clean and pure as if we were coming out of that water all over again. I hope that we realize what a privilege it is to be able to partake of the sacrament. Brothers and sisters, if we fully understood how important that was, we would never miss an opportunity. I once heard it said that we would crawl on our hands and feet if we had to, to partake of the sacrament, to be able to leave behind our mistakes, to be able to be perfected in that moment, to be qualified to be in the presence of God. Brothers and sisters, through covenants, do we access the power of God to overcome all the things of this world? A couple of quotes that I'd like you to reach, that I'd like to read from President Russell M. Nelson. More regular time in the temple will allow the Lord to teach you how to draw upon his priesthood powers. I think that that's obvious. In the temple, you are endowed with God's power. Your increased temple worship and service will enhance your connection to heaven. Because Jesus Christ is at the center of everything we do in the temple, as you think more about the temple, you will be thinking more about him. Every woman and every man who makes covenants with God and keeps those covenants has direct access to the power of God. Brothers and sisters, our president has promised us, and he promised us two times. He says, I promise you, and when the president of the church promises you something, I hope that we pay attention, I hope that we listen. He said, Spending more time in the temple where we make and keep covenants, where we have the ability to access God's true power. Spending more time in the temple will bless our lives more than anything else we can do. Think about that. If you were to do one thing to bless your lives, there is nothing greater that you can do than to spend more time in the temple. Brothers and sisters, I hope we listen to President Nelson. I hope that we heed his counsel and we strive to spend more time in the temple. Perhaps for some that may mean just renewing a temple recommend that we haven't had for a long time. Maybe that means going to the temple a single time. For some, if we're a regular temple attender, it means going every month, spending more time in the temple. If we're going every month, maybe we could set a goal to go every week. If you're going to the temple more than once a week, bless you, you're gonna to write to the front of the line when you get to heaven. But brothers and sisters, we can all strive to spend more time in the temple, and that will bless our lives as we come to know him and make and keep covenants with him. President Nelson has said, if you don't yet love to attend the temple, go more often, not less. That may seem counterintuitive, but it's an absolute truth. If you don't yet love to attend the temple, go more often, not less. Let the Lord through his spirit teach and inspire you there. I promise you that over time, the temple will become a place of safety, solace, and revelation. Brothers and sisters, I just share with you the knowledge that the Lord is hastening his work. This is his time. And we can all see it right before our eyes. You can't drive up and down I-15 without seeing a new temple going in on the right and another one going in on the left and another one going in right before us. This is an exciting time to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. 
I'm guessing if you took all the people that lived throughout the history of the world that were believers in Christ and allowed them to choose a time to be alive, I'm guessing the vast majority of them would want to be alive right now, right here, to see the hastening that we're witnessing right before our eyes. Brothers and sisters, the church is really good at building temples. We need to be really good at filling temples. It is my testimony that through the temple, the house of the Lord more than anything else, can we truly grow our testimonies of the Savior where we can feel of his presence, where we can learn of him and his plan and know how we should conduct our lives going forward. I think of his words to the Nephites in 3 Nephi chapter 17. He said unto them, and he was speaking to the righteous who were gathered around the temple. He said, behold, my bowels are filled with compassion toward you. Have ye any that are sick among you, bring them hither. Have ye any that are lame or blind or halt or maimed or leprous or that are withered or that are deaf or that are afflicted in any manner? Brothers and sisters, I think that includes just about every one of us. Bring them hither that I may heal them for I have compassion upon you and my bowels are filled with mercy. Brothers and sisters, that's the great promise that's extended to each and every one of us, that we may be healed. It makes me sad to think that there are members that live within this stake who perhaps feel that the atonement doesn't apply to them. Maybe it applies to other people, but not to me. Or perhaps they feel they've messed up so badly that the atonement can't possibly work for them or they've given up hope. Brothers and sisters, the atonement is infinite and is eternal and is for all people. And there's nothing that we can do that we can overcome and repent and be fully converted that the Lord will heal us. Brothers and sisters, may you know of my love for you. May you never take lightly the great blessing in your life it is to live in such a strong stake of Zion. The Highland Utah East stake is a remarkable place. You have great strength. You have the ability to bless the world. You play an important part in the gathering of Israel on both sides of the veil. May you find joy and happiness in your service. May you feel the love of your Heavenly Father in your life. May you go forward confident, knowing that your contribution is significant in preparing the world for his second coming. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.